Joining me now to run through all of the top stories today is former Labour advisor Stella Chanda Kidu and journalist and broadcaster Matthew Stadlin, as well as Talk TV's awesome political correspondent Alicia Fitzgerald. Thank you for joining me in the studio today. Let's start, Alicia, if we may, with a bit of a rundown for our viewers at home. I mean, politics has got interesting. It's quite like Parliament has actually woken up. It's been asleep for months. But let's start with a bit of a rundown for our viewers at home. What on earth is going on with Speaker Lindsay Hoyle? Uh, well, I mean, where do you want me to start? So much seems to have happened just over the span of 48 hours. So I won't bore everyone with the whole recap of how this all emerged. I'll do it as briefly as possible. SNP Opposition Day debates. Normal precedent is that you don't include amendments from another uh, opposition party. Yeah. Lindsay Hoyle bypassed that pre precedent on the occasion and included a Labour amendment. This then put his authority into question. Lots of people accusing Keir Starmer, maybe, of manipulating Sir Lindsay Hoyle, threatening him and saying that if he didn't discuss their amendment, that, that he, they wouldn't support him in the next general election and would say that they didn't have confidence in him as the Speaker of the House of Commons. So lots of infighting there. There have now been... Over 60 signatures on an early day motion uh, laid by William Ragg, Conservative MP, your colleague, Jake. Uh, lots of signatures on this early day motion to say that MPs don't have confidence in the Six, Speaker of the 68, House of Commons. 68, I believe the latest is this morning. Just to prove they're decisive, one of my colleagues put his name on and then took it off this morning. So there we go. <laughs> Who said politicians couldn't make their mind up about anything? But why this matters is because Lindsay Hoyle has said that he had to make that decision because he was concerned about the safety of members of parliament if they weren't given more than two options to vote for in that Commons vote. Now, my colleagues and the SNP have accused him of bowing to political pressure from Labour because it was rumoured there would be up to 100 Labour MPs voting against the official position of Keir Starmer. There was said to be up to two resignations from his shadow cabinet and even some Labour MPs saying they would leave the Labour Party and sit as independents if they weren't allowed to vote for the SNP amendment. That is what's caused politicians to suspect that undue pressure and influence has been brought to bear on Lindsay Hoyle, formerly a Labour MP, to dig his leader out of some hot water, Alicia. And where are we up to in terms of that sort of which side of the fence of politicians and you as a political commentator coming down to on that big question? Well, it's really interesting. I think we saw a really big shift in the narrative from Wednesday evening when this all kicked off uh, across the span of yesterday. So despite the fact that there are 67 signatures on this early day motion, there are also a lot of MPs coming to Lindsay Hoyle's defence from across the political spectrum. Lots of people coming forward and saying that he's a decent man, he's a good speaker, this was a blip, this was the, pretty much the only really big mistake that he's made as a speaker, so therefore he should be given the benefit of the doubt. Not to say that's everyone in Parliament, lots of people still Still feeling really passionately about this. Um, but what we've really noticed is it seems to be the Conservatives seem to have slightly gone in defence of the Speaker. Why? And that because they could... Uh, sorry, I can't get my words out today. It's been a long day. <laughs> it's, only, it's, only, it's only the morning still, Alicia. I know. But, I know. <laughs> so which side? So you say the Conservatives... So I'm, I support Lindsay Hall. I mm -hmm. think he's a great man. He's the adjoining MP. He's a, he used to be a Labour MP. I think he's doing a good job as Speaker. But he has apologised, not once, but twice for this clear error of judgment. He's accepted it's an error of judgment, but where do you fall? Was this political arm twisting by the Labour Party or was this a genuine concern about MPs' uh, MPs' safety? I mean, he said it's not acceptable, whichever it was. Where do you think it's falling with MPs in your own opinion? Well, look, Keir Starmer has said he categorically denies threatening Lindsay Hoyle. He said that. But what he has also admitted to is urging the Speaker to have a broad debate. And you can take from that what you will. Does urging the Speaker to have a broad debate mean that you're also suggesting that you must therefore include the Labour element of that debate? Or is that just a throwaway comment? And, you know, it's not really up to me to decide that. I'm sure that everyone listening and viewing this show can make their own mind up about what they think about that. And Matthew, uh, like all things in life, it's probably a bit of a mixture of both, isn't it? He probably was quite rightly concerned about MPs' safety. We've been talking about that a lot today on the show. But also, come on, this would have been a terrible day for Labour. Surely there was a bit of wrangling and arm twisting in the Speaker's office by, even if not Keir Starmer, senior Labour figures. Yeah, so let's take it step by step. First of all, I think on the Lindsay Hoyle question, he's safe. 
And the reason he's safe mostly is because your party have now swung in behind him because they think that's useful in their attacks on Keir Starmer and Labour. So they're redirecting their fire from the Speaker to Starmer, which is, of course, politically expedient for them. I think that the Speaker did make a mistake. I think he probably made it in good faith. He's admitted it. it. But he yeah. said, I uh, made a mistake. Al although his apology was a bit of a non-apology, because at the same time as admitting he made a mistake, he said he will always defend MPs' safety. And this gets to a really important question, which is, is our democratic body, the British Parliament, being dictated to by the mob? And actually, I don't think your headline was sensationalist. I think it was spot on. We cannot, under any circumstances, have that. We mustn't have our parliament be bullied or dictated to, even when MPs are justifiably scared. They cannot be bullied. On the politics, the party politics, just to, just to finish off, I do think that Starmer was lucky. I do think because of Hoyle's mistake, Sir Lindsay's mistake, he got away without what would have been a damaging rebellion and probably some front bench, some further front bench resignations. Well, wow, there you go. So, uh, Matthew, uh, by the way, thinks that Britain may be descending into a mob rule. But don't forget, you might think that at home. We want to hear from you. 0344 499 1000. This is the thing about Talk TV. It's about listening as much as it's about talking. Stella, coming to you, um, is Lindsay Hoyle safe? We seem to be the panel seems to think he's safe. I think he's safe. Should he well, be? Well, here is the situation with Lindsay Hoyle, right? A lot of people will be comparing him to John Berkwin. They will be saying he's so much better. He has really put some... Uh, he has really made uh, procedures look seem fairer in Parliament. And they will be saying... Why was Berko allowed to exist for such a long time? Well, the difference with Berko and Lindsay Hoyle is that John Berko was a former Conservative MP who had the full support of the Labour Party at the time. And the problem with what happened with Lindsay Hoyle now is that he's a former Labour MP who has been seen by some people as if he has been favouring the Labour Party. So that's where you have a problem. So you could be saying, um, OK, let's remove him because he has... Do you think, Stella, his apology was... Heartfelt? Uh, he was in the verge of tears. Okay, I was well, look, shocked by how emotional that's, that's he was. Stella thinks it's heartfelt. We're going to play it to you at home now. See what you think. I will reiterate, I made a judgement call that didn't end up in the position where I expected it to. I regret it. I apologise to the SNP. Just, just bear with me for more. I apologise and I apologise to the House. And it has been said. Both sides. I never, ever want to go through a situation where I pick up a phone to find a friend of whatever side has been murdered by terrorists. Well, there we go. I think a heartfelt apology. And, in fact, let's not forget that we're talking about this because it's so unusual that the Speaker has made this type of mistake. And as Stella was just saying, of course, under John Burko, a man who is currently banned from the parliamentary estate for life, it was basically a daily occurrence, Stella, wasn't it? Um, yes. Uh, and what I would add to that, uh, when you compare Lindsay Hall to John Berko, I think if the Conservative Party were to be strategic with this, they should really be backing Hoyle in full, because Hoyle will spend the rest of his <laughs> career as Speaker compensating for this incident, making sure all the other parties, apart from what could be the next government, the Labour Party, feel like he's as fair as possible. And I think that, actually, he would end up being an asset for the Conservative You mean like a referee party. who sends someone off wrongly on one side and then compensates yes, by exactly, sending someone off on exactly. the other side? Well, but uh, now uh, that we've started uh, with the... But, but the real question is here, isn't it, is that whether it was because of political pressure or whether because of the intimidation of MPs. It was the wrong thing to do. He's apologised for that. Mm. But I'm going to focus now on that intimidation of MPs because also projected onto Parliament was what is said by most, and in fact many, to be a genocidal statement chanted by people who were against the war of Israel against Hamas uh, from the river to the sea. And we're going to hear now from one of my colleagues, Andrew Percy, who spoke about that in the debate yesterday. If we have a rerun of the debate we had yesterday, we will have exactly the same thing happen again, which is that members will not vote with their hearts because they are frightened and they are scared. Yeah, yeah. And what, what do we expect? For months I've been standing up here 
talking about the people on our streets, demanding death to Jews, demanding jihad, demanding intifadas, as the police stand by and allow that to happen. Last night, a genocidal call for from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, was projected onto this building. That, that message says no Jew is welcome in uh, the state of Israel or in that land. This is going to continue happening because we're not dealing with it. Well, you can see that the temperature was pretty high in Parliament. And, of course, that, that message was, and we can see there on your screens, projected on, onto Parliament by protesters. And the police stood round and did nothing. And, in fact, they've said, having been criticised, that there is no criminal offence that they could prosecute people for. Well, I don't know if anyone else likes me, like me, watches the police on these videos that people put on the internet. Everything you do in this country seems to be a public order offence that, by any measure, is a public order offence, Matthew, isn't it? Yeah, look, I, when I was a producer at the BBC many, many years ago, and I was producing the 2010 general election, I managed to get the permission of the Commons authorities to project, I think, the exit poll onto Big Ben. Mm. Right? And that was a big bureaucratic process to make sure I was able to do that for our national broadcaster. This is not on. It's absolutely unacceptable. I should just say on this issue of from the river to the sea, first of all, not everybody who uses that phrase means it anti-Semitically. But secondly, it is also true, as my understanding is, that Netanyahu himself, the Prime Minister of Israel, in the past has talked in the same terms mm -hmm. that he wants Israel to be from the river to the sea. Thank well, you, it's, it's, it's all very Thank well. You. Just to pick you up on that, I'll let's tell him in a minute. But we hear from Suella Braverman in writing in today's Telegraph, mm. Islamists, Islamists are bullying Britain into submission. Isn't it just the case? Whatever some people may think that statement uh, is perceived as or actually means, it is viewed by lots of Jewish people in this country as promoting genocide that's in the why state I would, of Israel. And that's why I Therefore, would... it should be a public order offence because it's putting people in fear of danger and, and intimidation. And is Suella Braverman right that, particularly around Parliament, particularly the way this is intimidating MPs, that the, the police have ceded our streets to Islamic protesters, that's her words, not mine, Islamic protesters who want to, without ever standing for election, without, um, you know, without trying to get elected on a manifesto that says they want to do something about this, to influence and change Parliament, and haven't this week they've succeeded, haven't they? Well, we are talking about a twice-sacked Home Secretary of your well, party, for a start. So yeah. we, do, we want to make that point. She clearly has an anti-immigration agenda. But let's leave Braverman out of it for a moment. We know that a lot of Jews do find that message to be anti-Semitic. And if there was such a message directed, say, at black people, there would be no quibbling about it. It would be quite straightforward. So although I'm right that a lot of people have used that without intending it to be anti-Semitic, because we know that a minority in this country find it so, I don't think it should be used. I do think the police should clamp down hard on it. But as someone with Jewish heritage myself, my grandparents were Jewish refugees, literally kicked out of their country by the Nazis. My great-great-uncle, one of the first to be murdered in Vienna after the Anschluss, I take anti-Semitism extremely seriously and I take Islamophobia equally seriously. Yeah. And my worry is that in our British media, that Islamophobia sometimes gets a free pass, doesn't go challenged, and that is a massive concern.